I'd like to call to order the third regular meeting of the 2018-2019 Common Council. And this is also going to be a significant public work stand up as I introduce them. From the Streets and Sanitation Department, we have Tim Ali, John Burkhard, and Jason Blasiola. Motor Vehicle Department, Dennis Klum and Rick Nye. Buildings and Grounds, Mike Williams. The Wastewater Treatment Plant, Steve Jossart. Engineering Department, Ryan. Seconds month. This year's theme is Engage at Every Age. I would also like to thank the city leadership team for the commitment to become an age-friendly city and for encouraging citizen engagement of the over 55s. And on May 16th at Glass Coffee House, from 9.30 to 11, I will be hosting a community listening session to discuss what a great place Sheboygan is to live, work, and play, and to collect information as to how we can further improve our city. Thank you. Next, I'd like to just uh, review the City Hall uh, moving schedule. Today, the City Clerk's Office completed their move into the former Social Security Office across the street on 9th Street, and they joined the uh, Planning and Development Department, Building Inspection, Finance Department, uh, Payments Clerk over there. And uh, they're going to be settling in over the next week or two. And um, on May 30th, the other departments in City Hall, the City Attorney's Office, uh, Administration, the Mayor's Office, Human Resources, Assessors, Purchasing, uh, those will all be moving on uh, May 29th, 30th, and 31st. On June 4th, we're going to be having a City Hall groundbreaking. That will be taking from a uh, place from 11 to 12 o'clock. And right after that, we'll be turning the building over to Quasha's Construction to uh, begin the renovation of our interior. Now, during the, the, uh, the time that we're under construction, um, our committee meetings will be moved to various locations. For the most part, that's going to be the Mead Public Library and the Department of Public Works Conference Room. There may be a few others, so make sure you check the agenda for the location of that meeting. Otherwise, you're going to come down here and, uh, and, and be frustrated. And then the City Council uh, for our meeting on the 21st of this month will be moving to the courthouse in the, uh, the county board chambers on the fifth floor of the courthouse for our meetings for the remainder of the year and beyond if needed. Um, that'll conclude my remarks. Thank you very much. The next item on the agenda is 6.1, adopting the rules of the Common Council. Alderperson Wolf. Thank you, Mayor. For 1.6, I make a motion to approve. Second. Thank you for that motion and support. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll? Nine eyes. Motion passes. Next, we'll move on to a presentation uh, on aldermanic training with our three new uh, alder persons that were just elected, uh, two of them that uh, have one year under their belt and some of us longer. This is an appropriate time for us to review the aldermanic training. And with that, I'll turn it over to Administrator Hofflin to begin the process. Uh, I want to extend my appreciation to council leadership as well as the uh, full-time elected officials who made the suggestion that uh, we present this to all members of the Common Council in light of what uh, Mayor Mike identified that uh, I think uh, seven uh, have two years or less of, of experience. We thought it would be uh, a great opportunity uh, even for those that have been around a few years maybe as a refresher. Uh, again tonight, uh, 
Alderperson Todd Wolf, Mayor Lynn Donahue, Mayor Mike, um, City Attorney Chuck Adams, City Clerk Meredith De Bruyne. Um, Sandy Rourke will also be involved. And again, uh, thanks to my budget analyst, Carrie Aarons, for uh, gathering a lot of the information. A couple things I, I want to point out. Again, some of the documents are available, hard copy, and as alders, you should have a hard copy. Some documents are available simply through the website. For the new alders uh, who don't have a budget document, we're trying to get copies from uh, one of the nine or a couple of the nine that left uh, in April. Uh, no doubt it's easier, especially your first year, to have a hard copy and being able to kind of thumb through. We, we've, tried, we've attempted to put this document in a, in a user-friendly electronic version. It's referred to as a flipbook format. It's just easier to kind of thumb through electronically, but uh, it's no doubt being able to make notes in the margin uh, definitely, I think, helps. will help you better understand this document. Uh, the other uh, week, uh, we discussed at length the strategic plan. And as, as all of you know, this is really the foundation for a lot of what we do, whether it be uh, developing budget, five-year cap improvement plan, uh, performance measurements, uh, and then ultimately putting together upcoming budget documents. Uh, this is, again, that five-year cap improvement. Uh, your city staff is busy working on finalizing this. It's already on many of your agendas uh, for next, uh, plan for next week. So you'll be seeing the details uh, from your respective department heads of your committees. Uh, at the end of this month, the uh, Capital Improvement Commission will have their first meeting, first of two. Um, and again, five years, they'll be focused, but they'll be spending extra time on the 2019 just because those projects uh, and equipment purchases will be before you, before you know it. So again, this one, uh, again, typically we don't have hard copy for you. This typically is an online version. Um, all of you should have on your desk uh, copies of different documents that I'm going to be referring to, uh, as well as others that will be making presentation tonight. Uh, one thing I uh, want to mention, uh, other key documents, I guess, before we get into the, this paperwork is uh, audits uh, is on our Comprehensive annual financial report is on for next Monday before finance and personnel. Again, that's another major document that is really critical to, um, it's a reflection of how we ended up financially last year. Uh, no doubt as we go before Moody's for a credit rating review, uh, that's something that they spent a lot of time looking at. Also, uh, Kier Aaron's put together a combination uh, of uh, annual reports it's referred to on our website as annual performance report. And again, a lot of time and effort was put together by many department heads of their activity, including some of their benchmarks uh, uh, in calendar year 2017. Uh, two documents that were added late, depending on when you got to your desk or if you visited over the weekend, I added a copy for all of you of my employment agreement with, with you as a common counsel. So in case you did not have that for your files, you should have that. Uh, second uh, document, I think, again, toward the top, is something that we uh, found as we were looking to update our um, orientation session, and that is uh, the job of a council member. Uh, actually, the state of Wisconsin doesn't have a great handbook. We found this from Washington State. And again, most of the theories or policies still apply here in Wisconsin. So this is really a, a quick sort of primer as far as duties. Uh, and again, uh, I think Mary Lynn and others will be discussing in more detail um, as far as the uh, roles of a council member. A couple key things that, that came to mind looking through this handout. Uh, again, very obvious things that you're already aware of. Council sets the policy staff implements the policy. We'll, uh, also on this handout, responding to constituents' complaints, relationship with city attorney. Uh, on the second page is personnel management. Again, as council members, you s determine the number of employees. Uh, you also approve the compensation plan for those employees, and that's up to your professional staff to manage um, and 
to manage, conduct evaluations. And I think those are the key things uh, I wanted to go over with you uh, at this point. And again, I think between Todd and Mary Lynn, uh, you'll be getting into a little bit more detail. Um, one thing uh, to mention off the top, and again, I think maybe Mary Lynn will be covering this, is your interaction with your professional staff. Uh, if, if you're going to be asking for um, a very general question, uh, by all means, you know, please contact a management team member directly. If it's something that you need a more detailed analysis, that's going to take uh, considerable work. Please go through me on that. Uh, no doubt I'm aware as of the priorities of the management team members. And if it's something that's going to take them uh, sort of offline or might be in conflict with other deadlines that are before them, uh, if you come to me or through me, uh, I can help coordinate that. Uh, again, if it's something that uh, is, is of a subject matter that may be of interest to your fellow council members or your fellow committee members, that's something that you may want to talk, talk with your committee chair uh, and get it on maybe one of your upcoming agendas if you're looking for a more detailed analysis that might have policy implications. Uh, the rest of uh, my uh, discussion tonight will fall in line with this. Hopefully you have a summary of the outline for tonight. Uh, basic structure, I think I discussed. Uh, basic budget category and budget process overview. Uh, on the top of your original packet is a schedule of the, of the budget development for 2019. Uh, at top it says 2019 budget schedule. A couple meetings to take note of. Uh, th three quarters of the way down, uh, September 24th, which is a Monday night. Uh, that is the first uh, comprehensive review of the council meeting in the, in the form of a committee of the whole where you'll be discussing the overall budget. And again, prior to that time, you'll be seeing the budget uh, through your respective committee commissions and boards, but this will be a first chance to pool it all together and provide comment and then direction back to staff if you feel... Uh, additional priorities need to be considered or possibly cuts depending uh, on uh, where, we're, where we're at as far as meeting, um, meeting the needs of the community and, and specifically how it affects the tax, tax rate. Uh, another a key meeting is the second from the last, which is Oct Monday, October 15th, and that's the public hearing on the budget. So again, as you uh, look at your, your, maybe your vacation plans, uh, if you could work around those two dates, I think that those two meetings are, are important as we develop the budget itself. Uh, one thing uh, I would like to draw your attention to is the next document, which is called the Executive Program Budget and Brief. That's a colored uh, top page. Uh, this is an attempt by city staff, instead of 400 plus documents that are in this big three ring binder, uh, this is a quick uh, synopsis of, of our budget. And no doubt this was a, at the time it was published in September of 2017, it was a draft. There's been a couple minor changes made. But I think for newer alders, this I think will give you a sense as to key, key issues that city staff works on beyond and above the strategic plan. I'd like to turn your attention to, I think it's the fourth page which has uh, kind of like a chart on it this page I think be, should give you a sense as to unfortunately complicate a uh, complicated accounting structure oftentimes uh, I, I think as you are approached by citizens uh, sometimes you hear comments of well if we, we need additional money for for this project or program and I think oftentimes citizens uh, aren't and maybe even citizens that are maybe on your commissions aren't aware that we have a very uh, complicated accounting process no doubt we comply with uh, with general accounting uh, uh, principles but uh, all in all on this page it starts the list of 49 different funds 
So it's not a simple matter that all the money is pooled uh, or commingled into one fund. The largest, of course, is the general fund, which is actually shaded in blue. It might be hard, a little hard to read. Roughly $37 million, I think that is our largest fund. The next category of funds are special revenue funds. And again, this is tip, typically tied to uh, a larger revenue that is specific as far as how you can spend it. And there are 15 different special revenue funds. The largest is Mead Library, Tourism, and then further down the list is the Ambulance Fund. So three million down to a million. So those, and I think it makes sense, each of those have a very large revenue source. And again, uh, no surprise, uh, it, we're restricted as far as what we can spend that money on. Next begins our debt service fund. Uh, the largest is the general geo debt fund. Our second largest is TID number six, which is the harbor uh, center uh, of our community, which goes all the way from the marina down to riverfront, uh, down to the Sheboygan River, and then up, uh, I think, 8th Avenue, or 8th Street on the east, and then on the west, it, it's uh, west of Sheboygan uh, River up to uh, Pennsylvania Avenue. So it, it is geographically our largest TIF. Uh, this, this coming year, we're gonna be amending uh, or creating a maybe an overlay uh, associated with some of that area as we look at uh, focusing really on uh, Indiana Avenue uh, section of our, our community. If you turn the page, uh, third largest uh, debt service fund is TID 14. Um, at almost a million dollars, $902,000. Uh, this area is Taylor Height, so we're Festival Foods. And this last year, uh, city staff recommended amending the geographic boundaries of that TID. It goes now up to the former Memorial Mall. We wanted to take advantage of the tax base increase associated with the Meyer project. So those are the top three debt service funds. <coughs> Next category is a capital improvement fund. Um, capital projects fund uh, and capital improvement fund are kind of tied for almost $11 million each. Uh, specifically, the capital project funds are those capital projects where we typically do not borrow money to, uh, to pay for the project. The next one, capital improvement fund, in fact, we rely heavily upon borrowed funds for those projects or equipment purchases. So that's the difference between these two funds. The next largest is uh, TID 18, as far as expenditures. TID 18, of course, is the new South Point Enterprise Campus, and uh, this shows a little over $3 million will be spent. I think originally we anticipated that in calendar year 18, we would just purchase the land and, and wait for a future year to actually make the improvements. Again, as you know, we're, we're ahead of ourselves uh, as far as uh, the original projection on activity. Um, next category is called fiduciary funds. Again, these are uh, perpetual care type or trust funds, just a couple very small ones. And then proprietary funds uh, that is made up of two different types of funds. One is called enterprise fund or a, like a business fund, a true business-like fund. The first, and then the second is called internal service fund. The first uh, Four uh, are internal service funds, so like our motor vehicle fund, health insurance fund, liability insurance, workers' compensation, uh, information technology. That's where we are our own customer. So we center some of our personnel costs, equipment purchases in these funds, and then we bill out for our services or bill out the time for our equipment. So we're our own customer. Uh, the last, I think, five, starting at boat, facility fund, parking utility, transit, water, and wastewater, those, in essence, we act like a business as far as how we operate. Um, so uh, if you look at the second column, you can see it tallies up to $121 million. So a lot of money goes through your hands, our hands, in a given year. Uh, please note, of course, the water utility has a separate uh, board of water commissioners uh, they finalize uh, their budget, they uh, set their personnel 
uh, numbers, compensation, uh, but they go through the city as it relates to debt issuance. Uh, again, uh, please take time as you have time. Uh, a couple pages further in, at the top of the page, it has information on our debt service or our, the amount of our debt. Uh, this, is, this is a very important topic, especially as we uh, <coughs> begin to reaffirm our, our AA2 rating uh, with Moody's in the next uh, couple weeks. Uh, you can see at the top, we have a chart as far as uh, net debt outstanding and ratio of net debt to debt capacity. Uh, that last column, you can see that we're at 20.6%. 20 Our uh, policy as a community is to be at no more than 60% of our state allowed uh, capacity. You can see that we're substantially below that. And oftentimes the majority of our debt is TIF related or economic development related where most of those debt payments are gonna be tied to tax base created within that TID and it's referred to as tax increment. So the general property taxes paying for our debt is relatively small to the overall debt that the city has. Uh, as, uh, to be specific, of our tax rate of $9.37 for city purposes, only $1.24 of that is going specifically for non-TID related debt payment. So that works out to be 13% of our taxes that we take in, only 13% goes for debt, the rest is used for other purposes. Uh, that's the extent on this document that I wanted to draw your attention to. Uh, strategic plan is next on your agenda. Again, I think we discussed that uh, adequately over the past uh, week or two. And again, I think you're very well aware that we have six focus areas, goals, ob objectives, and then very specific action items and performance measurements. Uh, in your packet, uh, there is a ledger size sheet which has uh, the 2017 complete year of performance measurements and action items. Uh, what our status is in achieving those action items and how we did as far as meeting expectations as it related to the uh, performance measures. Uh, you will be receiving an update on the 2018 first quarter action items and performance benchmarks when we meet in two weeks. So s your city staff is busy pulling, pulling together that information. Some of you will receive d more detailed discussion at your committee meetings this next week. Uh, again, in addition to the performance measures that are in the strategic plan, there are significant other uh, measurements or analytics that your department heads uh, are keeping track of and you'll receive a discussion of those and an update of those at your committee meetings. Uh, next on the list is citizen engagement program. Uh, the city, I think in May of 2017, approved a, citizen, a formalized citizen engagement program. Uh, three categories of organizing ideas. One is if you receive an, in, an inquiry from a citizen or if you as a council member have an idea, uh, go ahead and address it right to city staff. Another is to place it on an agenda for a committee uh, consideration. And last is uh, ask finance and personnel committee to, to discuss that topic. Uh, this uh, citizen engagement program, I don't think you have a copy in your packet. Oh, yeah. A copy can be found uh, on the city's website if you uh, do a search. Um, ways in which we uh, solicit community input uh, is through uh, common council li listening sessions, town hall, open houses or forums, round table or focus groups. I think we heard tonight from Wendy Schmitz that uh, she, as early as uh, this next week, she's gonna be holding one of those uh, round table, one-on-one -on -one conferences, social media. We get a lot of input through social media, our city's website, uh, traditional media outlets, uh, and then partnerships with others in the community, whether it be school or other youth activity. Uh, as you know, we rely heavily upon volunteers, uh, especially at the committee, commission, and board level. Um, 
recently the mayor reappointed or appointed new citizens to serve on these different uh, committees. Uh, uh, we have a volunteer register so we can keep track of those that have expressed interest in the past. So if we do have possibly a, a task force or an ad hoc committee, we can use that as the basis for possible citizen appointment. Some of you may have been involved in the last year or two with one of our uh, task force, the Lakefront Water Safety Task Force. It was a very successful, very thoughtful task force, and they accomplished a lot in, in their short time that, that, that they met. So that's a great example of citizen engagement. Uh, next is citizen business and communication. There's a listing on your orientation. Uh, the monthly city newsletter, which I think uh, at least one page of that is included in your packet. Social media, of course, we have Nextel, Nextdoor, we have uh, Twitter, uh, we have uh, Facebook. Uh, multiple departments have their own websites. Uh, so again, I think we're doing a good job of trying to f uh, reach out to our citizens uh, and there's opportunities for citizens to respond oftentimes through that social media outlet. Uh, citizen surveys are, as you're aware, are done annually. In the past, we've done it in July, uh, June or July. Uh, this past year, specifically tied to updating the strategic plans action items, we moved it up to February. Uh, and actually, I think for staff and their schedule, that probably works best. So you'll probably see uh, going through finance and personnel, December, January, we'll be finalizing the questions and then issuing the uh, uh, annual survey probably in February of each year. Uh, departmental newsletters and in, internal employee newsletters, uh, we now have that uh, on a quarterly basis. And reports, as I mentioned, are issued in April. Um, and so those are some of our major uh, communications uh, with our citizens. Uh, before Sandy comes up and talks about personnel policies for elected officials, just to go through uh, the rest of this packet information that was on your desk, uh, in case I missed something, uh, we do have the budgetary basis, which some of this uh, goes into a little bit more detail as to what each of the funds are. I mentioned earlier tonight uh, the different categories, such as debt, uh, internal service funds, but this gives you a more detailed list of all those funds. An org, an org chart, Table organization is included in your packet as well. Uh, personnel schedule is included in your packet. Uh, interesting to note, uh, I did the math. If you look at police, fire, and public works, uh, that represents 58% of city staff, those three departments alone. Uh, the highest is police with 23%, so one out of four employees uh, are employed employees of specifically of the police department. <clears throat> Capital improvement program, I alluded to that you're com they're going through your committees. Uh, again, May 29th is the first meeting of the Capital Improvements Commission, uh, and then you can read the rest. Also in your packet uh, is a quick summary, executive summary of the uh, 2018 community survey. Again, that is done annually. As well as for alders, we do provide you with a full copy, including uh, the individual comments section, which is often uh, interesting and fun to read. Uh, <laughs> uh, some of you may not be aware, in February, we publish a Sheboygan performance scorecard. And again, we try and pick uh, analytics that are consistent with our strategic plan to show you how what kind of progress we're making for better, for worse on those, anal uh, on those analytics. And uh, we also have sort of a snapshot of who we are as the city of Sheboygan and, and its population. So I, again, I think very well done and I think very interesting. Uh, another document that we create after we finalize the tax bill is where, where did your tax dollars go? And I think this is surprising even for me as a city administrator, uh, the average tax bill for city purposes, uh, the average value of a home is $108,927. So 50% of the homes in the city of Sheboygan are more and 50% are even lower than that amount. 
uh, $1, so $1,060 is what we get from the average home to perform our city operations. If you divide that by 12 months, it's $88. If you divide it down to a per day, it's, it's $2.97. That's what we get as a city to operate and do everything that we do. The top two categories as far as money being spent are police protection. 288 of that 1,060 goes for police. For fire protection, $195. So 483, almost half of the money we get in taxes goes toward those two critical services. Uh, so again, if you get a chance, uh, read through that. Uh, it's it's in interesting. Uh, with that, uh, Sandy, if you want to come up. Again, I appreciate your time this evening to go through that list. Good evening. Good evening. I'm not going to read the entire handbook to you. <laughs> Welcome. Sandy, can you pull the mic down a little bit? There you go. Yep. Sure. What I forwarded you on Friday in your email is a copy of our harassment policy. This talks about sexual harassment, hostile work environment, and a workplace that's free of violence. Those all apply to you, even though you're not employees. There are certain liabilities that we have because you are an elected official. So going through the handbook, <coughs> what I did for the handbook, I didn't print out the entire thing for you. We're going to try and save paper. But on the second page, what I printed out is a table of contents highlighting the sections that apply to you. So for instance, you're, all of you are issued an email address. It's your responsibility to, to act ethically and legally on that device that you're, you're provided or the email address. So use of city property applies to you. Uh, dress code may apply to you. Concealed carry. Uh, employees cannot have armed weapons on the premise unless they are authorized to do so, so police department. But other employees are not, and you are considered an employee for the purposes of concealed carry. You cannot have a weapon on the premise. You have a right not to be harassed by citizens, by employees, and they have the right not to be harassed by you. And again, zero tolerance for workplace violence. Should you have any questions on harassment, if you feel you're not sure how it works, you feel you're being harassed, come and see me and we can talk it through. And then there's an acknowledgement form too that I will pass out. Once you have had an opportunity to read through the documents or feel comfortable, please sign the acknowledgement form. Thank you. start next. So now we're moving to uh, Roman numeral two on your outline, uh, the common council and, and how businesses is transacted. And what might be helpful, I know you have a copy both uh, in, on, in print and also uh, on your laptops of the uh, common council handbook, the uh, rules for uh, the generally, rule, uh, generally used rules of order, procedure, and conduct. And I'm going to kind of walk through some of those things. Uh, and I think that'll help you kind of uh, keep track of what I'm saying mm -hmm. rather than just listening to me drone on. That it's in part of the city clerk handout that I gave you if you want the paper copy of it. So starting with page two, uh, there's a description of common council uh, proceedings and uh, our generally used rules of order and procedure. And there are some important things to uh, remember. First of all, you can only act on something if it's actually posted on the agenda. If it's not on the agenda, we're not going to be talking about it. We're not going to be acting on it. Um, this doesn't happen so often at the council level, but at the committee level, it does happen relatively often. You'll also see items that are posted for discussion only. 
If it says for discussion only, it's for discussion only. There will not be any action taken on that item uh, that night. You've noticed uh, probably on your agenda that uh, at the end uh, we do have a section on our Common Council agenda entitled Other Matters Authorized by Law. And that's kind of a unique section. We do add things to that, uh, and we add them uh, right up until uh, uh, in, including the day of the meeting. But again, these are items about which no action can be taken uh, in order to comply with uh, uh, public meetings laws. We take no action on these other matters. Uh, in some ways, we almost treat it as if it's not part of the agenda. It's really more a notice to you that there are some additional items that are going to get forwarded to committees to be dealt with uh, at a committee level the following week and then come back to council uh, in the future. Some people call it a first reading. Uh, so if it's on those other matters, uh, we will not be acting on them and we will not even be talking about them notwithstanding what happened a few weeks ago. Um, you also will see on the agenda something called the consent agenda. And the, the purpose of the consent agenda is this. I, I remember years ago, I've been around a while, and we didn't have a consent agenda, and our meetings went forever because there were a lot of things that came up. We had to vote separately on them. The consent agenda is the items that are generally believed to be non-controversial, uh, often uh, you know, uh, things that happen, came through committee uh, unanimously or they're regular annual or monthly uh, types of items. And they will go on that consent agenda and everything in the consent agenda gets approved in one fell swoop. Now, sometimes uh, we have to guess as to what is going to be non-controversial. And I think the mayor and Meredith do a very good job of, of guessing what is going to be non-controversial. But occasionally there will be an item on there that you feel like, no, no, I, I want some further discussion. I want to consider this separately. And you have every right to do that. Uh, all it takes to get an item uh, off of the consent agenda is to make a request for uh, separate action uh, once the motion has been made to approve the agenda. So Alderman Todd, as, as the council president, will make a motion to uh, approve uh, the agenda, you can then raise your hand and say, I'd like item number whatever on the consent agenda to be pulled separately, uh, and it will be uh, treated separately. Additionally, sometimes you may just want to discuss an item on the consent agenda because you have a question about it. Uh, a lot of times these may come through committees uh, that you weren't able to attend that committee meeting or, or you see something that you just uh, want to have a clarification on, you can also do that. You can just simply ask, I'd like to ha ask a question about an item on the consent agenda, um, and we will do that. Uh, automatically, again, you have the right uh, to have that done. Uh, we're not putting things on the consent agenda to just blow them past you. It's really more uh, hopefully consolidating some things to make them more simple. Anytime you want something out of, that, uh, out of that consent agenda, you have the right to do that. Um, there are all, there's also a rule on uh, a request to pull forward a document out of order. And the rule as far as taking things out of the order on the agenda is as follows. The mayor sets the order of the agenda. Um, and as the chair of, of council, he can do that. You, as a uh, council member, have every right to ask him uh, to change the order of the agenda. And in most cases, um, I think uh, the mayor has generally just done just that. If somebody asks, it can be done. Now, if he has some strategic reason for not doing that, he does have the authority to say, no, I've set the agenda. I'm not going to change the order of the agenda. Uh, but you do then have a right to uh, request that the chair's ruling be overruled. And actually, any time the mayor makes a ruling as sort of the chairman of the, the council, you have a right uh, to request that he be overruled. And so you object to that ruling, and the mayor turns down your objection, uh, then it can go to a, uh, if you request it, a vote of the common council, and the common council can, by a majority vote, overrule uh, the chair in, in those kinds of determinations. 
Uh, it can get complicated, and, and if things get complicated, I'll be there to whisper in the mayor's ear and, and kind of tell him what he should and shouldn't do, uh, what he can and can't do. Uh, but in general, you do have that ability to uh, contest the, the mayor's rulings if you so desire. Before I move on to some other sections, I guess I'm willing to entertain any questions if you have any on those. Okay. So let's talk about the kinds of documents that you'll see on the council agenda. Uh, ordinances, first of all. Ordinances, as you probably already know, they're the laws of the city. Uh, they are the legislation that you're approving, and uh, an ordinance, in essence, enacts new legislation, or it can amend or repeal uh, legislation already on the books. Uh, there are two kinds of ordinances. There are regular ordinances, and there are what we call charter ordinances. Charter ordinances get at the sort of the, the basic uh, construction of the Common Council. So the last time we uh, passed a charter ordinance was actually the charter ordinance to reduce the size of the Common Council from 16 to 10, and then to provide how election of the 10 of you uh, would take place. So it is... Uh, the result of that, why half of you have one-year terms and half of you have two-year terms, and a few of you are probably going to have to run three years in a row, unfortunately, uh, as a result of that. Uh, charter ordinances uh, do require a supermajority vote, but they're fairly uncommon. Uh, most ordinances, not all, uh, require only a majority vote. Generally, if you want to pass an ordinance, you move to adopt the ordinance. Uh, that, that's what you would do, and there'll be a second, and it'll go uh, for a uh, uh, roll call vote. Resolutions are a little less formal than ordinances. Uh, I should note that ordinances usually, but not always, then get codified, which means they actually get entered into our code of ordinances. There are some exceptions. Uh, we do have some ordinances that for various reasons don't get codified. That doesn't mean they don't have the same authority. Uh, they do, uh, but they're just not simply in the code of ordinances. If you ever believe that there's an ordinance out there that you can't find in the code book, call my office. We'll, we'll help you find it. Occasionally it is because it's non-codified. Resolutions are a little less formal. They're designed to uh, allow you to conduct sort of the general, regular business of the Common Council. Uh, they're generally less permanent uh, than ordinances are. Uh, oftentimes, they simply uh, direct or authorize city officials to act in a certain way. So very commonly, you'll see a resolution that authorizes the mayor and the city clerk to sign various uh, agreements or, or documents. Um, they're often used as well to create special study committees or boards uh, that assist the Common Council in doing its business. And if you want to pass a resolution, it's I move to adopt the resolution. Uh, again, generally, it's a majority vote. There are some exceptions. Uh, if we're, for example, altering the adopted budget, those do require a two-thirds vote of the membership of the Council. <clears throat> So those are ordinances and resolutions. Those are really kind of the meat of if something is going to change, if, if there's legislation or, or you want to authorize something to happen, that's how it happens. There are some other documents. Uh, reports and, and communications are the most common. There are two kinds of reports, reports of committee and reports of officers. You've seen them probably referred to as RCs and ROs. RCs, or reports of committees, are reports that come out of committee meetings. So if there is an action taken out of a committee meeting, staff comes to you and recommends that you approve a resolution or asks you to take certain actions, there will be an RC, a report of committee, that comes from the committee and comes to council. And at council, generally, you will then vote to receive uh, the report of committee uh, but in addition to that, you will approve some other document, a resolution or a, a, an ordinance, or there occasionally it's licenses and things like that uh, that get approved. The report of committee uh, does not necessarily get approved. You're simply receiving it uh, for information. Occasionally it could be filed as well, which basically means you're tossing it. A report of officers are similar. A report of officers, though, generally start out going to uh, to committees. So report of officers are generally uh, recommendations that are being submitted by uh, officers of the city, department heads, elected officials. 
uh, or by uh, boards and commissions by their, uh, by their chairs. Um, they generally do go first to committee, and so a committee will act on, on the RO, and, an, and a report of committee then, an RC, will come out of that along with whatever action that needs to be taken, uh, uh, or an ordinance, a resolution. Communications. Uh, communications are uh, letters uh, that are received by the mayor or by other persons or by the city clerk uh, that are then uh, submitted to the common council. Um, not all letters, not all petitions are placed on the council agenda, um, and not all of them uh, are placed on the agenda immediately. In fact, uh, I would say that most of the time those communications are best first directed uh, to staff members, uh, to department heads or others uh, who deal with the subject matter of those communications before they're submitted to council. And the reason for that is a lot of times the kinds of things that are being uh, dealt with in those communications are already being dealt with by a department or can be very efficiently dealt with by the department without having to wait a couple weeks to go to a meeting and then and run through a process. Um, and it also gives uh, departments an opportunity uh, to uh, deal with things and maybe make recommendations to you at the, the committee level. Um, a, a, a constituent might send a letter about a particular issue and a department head will say, hey, that's, you know, that's a good piece of information. There's some additional information that you need to know and here's a good way to solve this problem, not just to deal with this one issue, but to deal a little more uh, broadly. Uh, the mayor makes the determination in the end, uh, has the final decision as to what goes on the agenda and what does not. Uh, there certainly will be the opportunity if, um, if a communication comes in and there's a feeling that it's not being dealt with uh, to revisit uh, that communication and then ask the mayor to submit it at a later date. Uh, he will make that determination in consultation uh, with the city clerk. Some other documents, uh, uh, you will often see attachments, exhibits, other documents that are used to help you uh, prepare for committee or council meetings. In fact, we had a number of those today uh, for the purposes of this uh, training. Generally, um, those documents need to be placed on, on board docs for council meetings and even for committee meetings uh, because they are public documents and public documents are meant to be made uh, available not only to you, uh, but to uh, the general public as well. And so in most situations, uh, if an item is going to be handed out to you, it should also be on board docs. Occasionally that doesn't work so well uh, because of timing, and then we'll always put uh, copies in the back where there are printed copies of the agenda. And there are some items uh, that are not necessarily available to the general public, generally related to items that are in closed session. Uh, those items, uh, first of all, will not be passed out until we go into closed session. Those items will then also generally be collected back from you uh, before we go back into open session. Uh, so if you get items uh, handed out to you during closed session, please hand them back in uh, before we go into closed session. Many of those documents do still become open documents at some later date. Uh, and so we do have a responsibility. Meredith does keep track of uh, minutes during closed session as well, because as soon as the reason for the closed session disappears, they're open records and anybody can get at them and they need to be published. Same thing with documents, documents that get handed out during the meeting, Meredith needs to keep track of them as well. And as soon as the reason for them being in closed session disappears, they are available to the general public and need to be made available to them. One of the most common documents that, that you're seeing, it's a, it's a relatively new document to us at the city. It's an innovation that uh, uh, Daryl brought to us and it's an IFC, uh, uh, stands for item for consideration. I also like to call it information for committee. That's not its official designation, but it really describes what it is. It's information for a committee. And it's there uh, for um, members of uh, staff to provide you with information about the item that's before you, about the RO or about a resolution that's before you. It includes information such as how, does this, how is this going to have an impact fiscally? There's, there's uh, provision for that. Uh, it gives you some background. Why, why is this coming to you now instead of two weeks ago or three months from now? 
Uh, it provides you sort of the staff input, why the staff is recommending certain things uh, happen. It gives you a reference to the uh, relevant law so that you can take a look at that uh, in advance if you have any questions, uh, and then it recommends a particular action. Uh, I think it is our hope that uh, well before you actually show up at a, a committee meeting, uh, that you are reading those IFCs and reviewing them and making sure that you get information. Now, IFCs are not an official council document, so they're, you don't approve an IFC, you don't refer an IFC, it's information that's there. However, uh, even after the committee deals with it, we do generally keep those, those matters on board docs uh, because once an item is, let's say, approved at a, a committee level and now comes to the full common council, those of you who are not on that particular committee would like to probably have that same information provided to you, and so it is there uh, for you as well. Uh, it is uh, there in board docs uh, for you. Uh, just want to highlight again, any document that you would like to have uh, in included, uh, considered uh, a part of a meeting, make sure that uh, you get that to Meredith, make sure that uh, she has the uh, opportunity and the time frame uh, to be able to, to get that onto uh, board docs uh, because she does have a big job in keeping track of every single document that comes through uh, because potentially somebody could ask for them and we need to make sure that we can uh, provide them. Questions on this section and some of these items? Most common types of action that we take uh, when we pass an item, it's favorable action taken by the Common Council. Um, referral is to send an item somewhere uh, to a committee or to a commission or to a board. Um, common Council can refer matters to all sorts of committees, commissions, and boards. Uh, committees themselves do not have the authority to refer to other committees. Uh, generally what would have to happen is you would have to uh, refer it back to Council uh, for re-referral. Uh, um, occasionally uh, items will get referred to multiple committees. Uh, we try not to do that too often because it is a paperwork nightmare and then if a uh, c uh, two different committees come back with two different recommendations, then you've got a fight uh, of which one gets to go first and then the mayor has to pick which one is going to go first and then some of you out there might decide we want the other one to go first. Um, so we try not to dual refer or even triple refer, fortunately, with only three standing committees that's f as far as it goes, um, but it does occasionally happen. When an item is filed, uh, that is, in essence, your dispensing of the document immediately. Uh, it's like putting it in file 13, um, getting rid of it. It's no, it no longer really becomes an active document. And then when something lies over, that simply means that it's on the agenda, but nothing is happening with it today. It is going to lie until the next meeting. Occasionally, especially at the committee level, you will have documents that are, as we call it, uh, you know, in the council or in the committee's docket or in their folder, uh, but they don't show up on the agenda. Any document that has been referred to a committee, regardless of whether it's actually going to be on an agenda, is sort of under the purview of that committee. Now, it doesn't happen all that often, but committee chairs can sometimes choose to simply not put items on the agenda because they don't want to deal with them. Sometimes they do that for very good reasons, like an item isn't ripe, there are other things that are happening, uh, staff needs some more time to do it. Sometimes it's a little more political. Um, and there are ways to, to discharge a committee of documents and bring them back uh, to the council level um, without uh, the uh, sort of the acquiescence or permission of the chairman of a committee. Um, there are provisions for doing that. I'm not going to get into all those details here, but if ever that comes up, uh, you, can, you can do that. Uh, and remember that at the committee level, you're not actually taking action. You're recommending that the council take action. So when you're making an, uh, a motion at the committee level, uh, you should probably, even though we know what you mean if you don't say this, you should preface it with, you know, I move that this committee recommend that common council take action such and such an action. Uh, when uh, we call for a vote, there's two kinds of votes. There's voice votes and there are roll call votes. Uh, voice votes 
uh, are where you just simply say I um, and, uh, or nay. Uh, at the council level, those happen primarily on procedural matters and even on areas where um, they can be procedural matters will sometimes call for a roll call vote uh, anyway. So for example, you took a roll call vote to approve the, these rules. It could have been done by a voice vote, but um, it's perfectly valid to do it by a roll call vote as well. There are some items, though, that have to be taken by roll call, where we actually uh, determine who is taking what vote, each name. Uh, at, at the committee level, you, you know, you punt, or at, at the committee level, you have to say, the, uh, say what you're voting. Uh, at uh, this level, it can just be punched in on the computer. One important place to know where there is always a roll call vote required, including at the committee level, uh, is on uh, coming into and out of closed sessions. You can't just do a voice vote on those. You always have to take a roll call vote. It has to be recorded who voted how on each of those things. A roll call vote is also generally required when we adopt ordinances, resolutions, uh, reports of committee and officers, uh, when we do things related to levying taxes, appropriating funds, anything that, would re that could um, create or change a liability against the city. So when we have documents that, uh, for example, um, waive some level of indemnification or, or give up some kind of rights that are not necessarily financial, uh, those do have to come to you and they do have to uh, be passed by a roll call vote. If there is a voice vote and you want a roll call vote, you can also request that of the mayor and uh, it, will, it will occur. On page five of uh, this document, I'm not gonna go through all these, but there is a list of some commonly used motions. Whether they require a second, most of them do. Uh, whether they're debatable, many of them are, but not all of them. Uh, whether they can be amended and what the vote uh, required is. Um, you're not going to memorize all of that, um, but I think make sure that you don't lose this because there are, I guarantee you, there will be times you will want this information um, and it's probably easier just to pull it out and look at it than calling my office. But if you can't find it, call my office. We still will answer your question. <clears throat> Questions about this section of the uh, presentation? Okay, some other common rules, um, some of which we abide by very well, some of which you may be surprised to learn. Uh, first of all, remote attendance. Uh, we do allow for remote attendance, uh, meaning that if you are out of the city, even out of the country, um, you can still appear and vote at a common council meeting. Um, the biggest uh, issue that we have with that is just making sure that the technology works. Um, uh, if you're going to be appearing remotely, we need to know well in advance because it does need to be put on the agenda. Uh, it, it does need to be noticed. Um, make sure that you let us know enough in advance as well so that we can prepare to have the technology uh, available uh, necessary to do that. Our IT people do a great job, but if you tell them an hour before the meeting, um, they're going to be a lot more panicked and um, it may not turn out quite as well as if you give them sufficient time. You don't count towards the quorum if you appear remotely. So at a council meeting, this usually doesn't make that big of a deal. At a, at a committee meeting, it can, because of a committee of five, you need three present. Uh, and suddenly, if two people are missing and then one person is appearing remotely, you will not have a quorum. Um, so uh, that is important to note that we don't want you just appearing remotely for any old reason. Um, obviously, if you're out of the community for, and, and can't get back, well, that's a, that's a good reason. If you are uh, severely ill, um, as we had last year, um, that is a good reason uh, to appear remotely, and we encourage you uh, to do that. If you appear remotely, you cannot be part of a closed session as it currently stands. The reason for that is we don't have a good way currently under our current technology to ensure that the closed session remains closed when you're calling in, let's say, via a cell phone or, or by a computer monitor. Perhaps there will come a date when we can absolutely determine that no one else is available and then we would allow uh, people to uh, be part of closed sessions. But right now, not possible. Additionally, there are occasionally times, uh, generally hearings, and so this generally applies to the um, 
uh, licensing hearings and public safety committee where you're going to need to make a visual assessment of a witness's demeanor or of a piece of evidence or some other document. Uh, in those cases, if, if you don't have the ability to do that, you cannot participate uh, remotely. Some other things, um, you only have the right to speak twice on any single matter being debated. Once you've talked twice, the mayor isn't supposed to recognize you uh, any further. You would have to get leave of the Common Council. They would actually have to vote to allow you to speak a third time on an item. Privilege of the floor. Uh, we have a list of people uh, that have the, the privilege of the floor, meaning that uh, automatically the chair just sim can simply open the floor to those people uh, to speak. Uh, that includes myself, the mayor, city clerk, city administrator, chief of police, or such other police officer as in attendance the finance director treasurer, members of the Department of Engineering and Public Works, the director of planning and development, and members of the media who are confining themselves to their professional duty. And that's generally not for speaking, that's just generally allowing them into areas uh, on the floors, like if they're gonna take a photograph or something like that. Only those people who have the privilege of the floor are allowed to address the Common Council. Uh, however, you can make a motion to open the floor. So if there's someone else that, that you'd like to have speak, um, you can do that by making a motion to open the floor. Uh, you may address uh, those who have the privilege of the floor at the time that they have the floor. Normally, if you're going to address anyone, you're supposed to address the mayor. You're not supposed to address each other. You're not supposed to address the people out in, in the audience. Uh, only address the mayor, but the exception to that would be is someone else who has the privilege of the floor, uh, and then you can do that. If you want to address someone in the audience, um, that can be done, but you first have to get permission of the mayor uh, in order to do that. And if he denies you that privilege, you would have to challenge him and get a majority vote uh, to do that. Uh, don't engage in debate or become confrontational with people who have the privilege of the floor or to others to whom the floor has been opened. Um, and, uh, and don't get up during a meeting. You're not really supposed to cross the floor or leave the council chamber while the mayor is speaking, while the presiding officer is speaking, or someone uh, is, who has the privilege of the floor is speaking, or while there is a question being submitted. Um, wait until there's a break between items uh, uh, to leave. Uh, one other thing that I just kind of wanted to talk to, there are a number of other general rules of conduct, but one other that, that probably relates to some things that we do is what we call uh, being germane. So we do allow amendments uh, to items that come before you. So if there is a, a resolution or an ordinance that comes before you or a recommendation that comes before you, you can make amendments to those ordinances and resolutions, and there are certain situations where you can make other amendments as well. But amendments are meant to be just that, amendments. Changes to a document that you know, sort of keep things uh, generally the way they were, but improving them. And a, a, an, a motion to amend a document in a way uh, that really totally alters the nature of the original uh, ordinance or resolution is not germane. Now, the mayor, again, gets to make that determination. Um, and you, if you've been around for a little while, you've heard him make that determination a few times, uh, that an item is not germane. You can challenge him on that again as well, but it would take a majority of the Common Council to challenge that as well. Um, but the, the point is, we're not really supposed to be playing games with ordinances and resolutions, if it totally changes it, what you need to do is vote it down and start over um, rather than making huge uh, amendments. Questions or comments or concerns uh, regarding uh, that? Yes, Alderman Bourne. Uh, Attorney Adams, uh, going back to attending remotely, you can vote, but you don't count towards a quorum. Correct. What if we have an item that, re that requires a two-thirds majority, and there's somebody attending remotely, they don't count towards the quorum. Uh, now, the two-thirds, is that two-thirds of the entire body or those in attendance? Well, it depends. So there are a few items where it is required that you have a supermajority of the entire membership. 
Um, there are not very many of them, but there are a few, in which case it's two-thirds of every, every, everyone, regardless of how many are there. And of course, then having somebody appear remotely is very helpful in that circumstance. We also do have um, many, uh, many items only need a majority or a supermajority of those present and voting. Um, now, we, we, they, you don't count, if, you, you're, if you're present remotely, we don't count you to the, toward the quorum, but since you're voting, you do count towards that number. So it's not like, um, you know, oh, there's only nine of us present, but there are three more here, and that, that's gonna be enough to, to you know, it, we, we get 12 out of 9. Well, no, it, it would be 12 out of 12 or 7 out of 12 in determining a majority. Um, so you can't sort of play games with, let's have three people appear remotely so that the, the threshold is lower. It doesn't work that way. Good thought, though. <laughs> City Attorney, could you also talk a little bit about the, the quorum that's needed? Normally, that's one more than half, but I believe we, we need more than that because of some of the items that we discuss and vote on. Right, uh, so we do need a, a, a quorum of, you know, I didn't review this, but my recollection is we need to have 11 present to even conduct any business. But now with... Uh, with oh, you're right, 11 out of 16, so it, it's going to be less. Seven, aren't we? Seven, that would be right, seven, because six would not be enough. Um, seven to conduct any kind of business. There are some very few situations in which we require a three-fourths vote. The interesting thing there is you can conduct business with two-thirds present, with seven present, but seven might not be enough to actually pass something. Um, they're very rare that those situations come up. In that case, you would vote on the item knowing that it's going to go down to defeat even if it's unanimous among those present uh, because seven isn't enough. Uh, but those are very, very rare circumstances. So Generally, with, seven is enough. With our new number of 10, if three of you are, are here, we're good. But if that fourth one is missing, then we have a problem. We can't hold a meeting. And so when you know that you can't attend, get that information to myself and the city clerk as soon as possible so that uh, you know we can plan ahead. And, and if we would have to cancel a meeting or go back to somebody and say, are you sure you can't? Make that, you know, we will need to, to, to work through those issues if we have a lot of people who can't make a meeting. <coughs> Any other questions or comments? The last thing I wanted to talk about uh, was just simply the public's uh, involvement. We do have uh, rules uh, for the public forum. They're conducted there. As you know, uh, we do allow up to five people to speak for up to five minutes. Uh, if more than five people sign up, preference is given to city residents and to persons who pay property taxes to the city on real or personal property. They can only talk about items that are actually on uh, the agenda. Um, uh, there are some, some other rules that you may want to uh, review on that, uh, but there, there are, for example, there are ways to open it up beyond the five minutes if absolutely uh, necessary. At the committee level, um, we generally, I think some committees do have a public forum section, but the committees so far have not established rules for themselves as to how to do that. So generally, it's really up to the chair um, to make a determination. Some committees uh, and some committee chairs really like to be, give the, the, the public an opportunity to speak. Uh, there are a few situations in which the uh, public is actually encouraged to speak. So, for example, at the LHPS committee, we encourage the public to come and speak uh, with regard to um, uh, the waivers for uh, residency for sex offenders um, because that's really the proper place uh, for that to, to occur. I actually had a, a really good question from Alderman Mitchell on that. The, the, place, the proper place for them to be talking to you about those things is at those meetings because that is technically a hearing. Um, and so you're taking evidence at that time. Uh, but uh, if a chair feels that it's not appropriate at, at that point to take um, uh, you know, questions or comments from uh, the public, they can choose to make that decision. But again, just like you can challenge the ruling of, of the chair here, you can always challenge the ruling of the chair at a committee level. But you know, committees are much more informal. Um, generally, my office will have someone present at all of the standing committees, the three standing committees. Uh, if you ask us to, um, we will generally try to have someone available for the other committees, committee of the whole, 
um, uh, some of the other boards and committees architectural review. We don't automatically staff them, but we will come if, if you ask, um, unless you maybe you ask us 10 minutes before and we already have other things that we have to do. Um, but we'll, we'll generally try to be there. Questions or, yes? Uh, were you going to cover uh, walking quorums, or is that, or is that uh, coming up? I, I can. Um, since you asked about it now, I'll cover it now rather than in another part of the section. So uh, for the purposes of open meetings, um, we do have to worry about uh, when we have a quorum of council or a quorum of committee on a particular item. You're not supposed to be discussing official business outside of a properly noticed hearing. Walking quorums are sort of a, uh, in a situation where it takes a supermajority to pass an item, a walking quorum is, well, there, there's a negative quorum and a walking quorum. A, neg a walking quorum is where you're going from person to person to person. So you may not have six of you in a room together talking about business, but now if you're going from alder to alder to alder and just simply passing on that message, you've created a walking quorum and you may be in violation of uh, open meetings laws. You can't do that. Uh, that's why also we don't want you replying to all um, and we try very hard to hide everybody's emails and send everything as blind CC so to make it um, more difficult for you to mistakenly uh, reply uh, to all. Uh, a negative quorum is a situation in which you're, you may have a supermajority requirement. So let's say at a, at a common council meeting we have a two-thirds requirement that takes seven people uh, to, to pass a particular item. Let's say uh, uh, something that's changing the budget it happens relatively uh, frequently. Well, now four of you are enough to block it. So now with four of you, you're not a full quorum of the, of the council, but you are a, a negative quorum you, because you could stop an item from going through. So you have to pay attention to that as well. If suddenly four of you are talking business, uh, yeah, you might be in violation of, of open meetings laws. We don't want you to do that. The moral of that story is, and we'll get to that uh, a little bit further down on the agenda when we talk about open meetings laws, the moral of the story is always pay attention to who is with you and who you're talking to about city business. It's not illegal for you to, you know, have a friendly gathering and, you know, just have, you just so happen to meet at a local restaurant and there's four of you and, and you're, you know, passing the breeze, that nothing wrong with that. But suddenly, if you start actually talking about city business um, and you're doing things in a way that suggests that, yeah, you know, hey, you should vote this way, you know, uh, or I'm going to bring this amendment, you know, wait to do something until I bring this amendment. Well, enough of you start doing that together, whether it's serially or in, in a group, uh, you could be in violation of open meetings laws. Don't do that. Other questions on that? I have one question, and I don't know if this is uh, related or if it's different, but when there's a meeting and four or five of us show up at a uh, finance committee meeting and we're not on the committee but we're there, are we in violation? We can be. So one of the things that we do, and we're going to have to be a little more vigilant about it with the smaller council, but one of the things that we do is we do try to gauge whether there's the likelihood that, at a, say, at a committee meeting, there might possibly be a quorum of council or a quorum of another committee. Um, because there are ways that we can handle that. Um, if we know, let's say, finance committee is dealing with a, a really important issue uh, and we think there's going to be six of you at the meeting uh, because that's all it takes um, anymore, the five of you who are part of the committee and one others, we will um, put what we call a bad key notice on the agenda, saying there may be a, a quorum of, of, uh, uh, of the council at this meeting. In fact, I think we've been talking about whether we need to put bad key notices almost all the time now um, with, the, with the smaller size. Now, what a bad key notice does is it sort of gives you protection if sort of randomly um, you show up and, oh, wow, I'm at the, um, 
I'm at the Public Works Committee, but here's a, a quorum of the council. Or I'm at the Public Works Committee, and here's a quorum of the Law and Licensing, or the LHPS Committee, just, just so happens to be that way. It provides you some cover so that nobody can say that you're in violation of open meetings laws. Now, that doesn't mean that you can suddenly start, you know, taking action on items that are not on that agenda. Uh, and council actions are never on the uh, agenda of a, a committee meeting. But it does allow you then to participate in those uh, discussions at the committee level. That, that's, thank you for raising that because we did talk about that before and I think we need to follow through on making sure that we regularly do bad key notices. Well, and the reason I asked the question is because <coughs> we are a smaller council now and with five members on the a committee, and like you said, one person needs to show up, and I'd like to be more active in uh, attending some of the other committee meetings. I would be number six. Right. Sounds like you're coming to a lot of committee meetings, so it sounds like we're going to be putting bad key notices on all the committee, co committee agendas, so uh, at least the standing committees. So, good. Okay, the next item is reviewing an agenda. You want to take that? talk about it a little bit I wasn't on that part of the agenda but a, a council agenda is put into different categories um, and it's always on your board docs we put copies in the back um, if you want a paper copy but basically what Chuck talked about was a consent agenda which you will um, vote on in one motion unless you want to take something off um, it goes through the report of officers and then through the resolutions report of committees and then ordinances and then like Chuck said the other matters on the agenda are things that are added after the agenda was published so that they can't be acted upon or discussed they're just referred um, and then it goes through closed session and adjournment um, agendas everything that's on board docs has an attachment so if you click on any of the agenda items, you will be able to see the attachment. When you open it up, it will be the document, and then any other attachments like IFCs, <coughs> like agreements, um, things like that. So those are all on there for you to see and for you to review. Um, even like the adopting the rules today that you made a motion to approve, those are scanned in and available for you to look at prior to coming to the meeting that night. Um, and then usually on board docs, those are done from all the committee meetings also. Any other comments, questions? Anything there? Okay, then we'll go on to basic protocol, general rules of conduct. Um, just a few comments there. Uh, in the past, it's always been tradition for the council to stand up when they address the chair uh, and make a motion. And uh, we've started to relax that a little bit, but that's why you have the mics that you can put on so you can easily stand up. Now, when we're going to the, the county board chambers, the uh, mics are all going to be on your desk. So if you stand up, it's going to be difficult to use the mic. So we're, we're going to be expecting you to just make the motions and have your discussions, you know, from the chair uh, so that people can hear you uh, both in the chambers as well as on TV. The, um, the cameras here will all be transferred over to the, the county board chambers so that um, it may not be for that first meeting but subsequent meetings will definitely be able to be broadcast live as they are now and uh, it'll also offer the county board that that option as well to um, to stream their meetings right away before they could never do that uh, with their current setup they always had to be taped and recorded and then they could be rebroadcast um, proper dress uh, you know we'd like you to have a, a business look you know it used to be a time where it was a, a suit and tie all the time that's been relaxed a little bit but if you could wear a top coat for, for gentlemen and, and a dress shirt that would be appreciated and um, I don't know any other uh, things anybody would like to offer there okay and then next one is yep, Lynn, sorry um, Mary Lynn. this is just scooting back to reviewing the agenda um, <coughs> Board docs is just a huge improvement 
on how the council does business and gives us so much additional access to information. So actually, it's really important to look at the stuff and that really <coughs> makes you a better alder person. There are a couple things. Sometimes, I remember when I was new, I would find my name <coughs> on a resolution or an ordinance and I would be really surprised because that wasn't anything that I had ever, nobody had talked to me about or whatever. And those are just, uh, it's just a formality. It's how some of the ways we do business here are a little anachronistic. I mean, they've been doing it that way, you know, since people were scratching <laughs> their names in the desk drawer of my desk over there. Um, and uh, so it's, it's important to have those. And, and it's the same for signing the documents. You know, you get a whole bunch of documents and, you know, you sign those. And particularly if you're the chair of a committee or if your name is on a resolution. Um, but I think that those are just two things that really surprised me and took me a while to figure out when I was new. Um, and then the other thing I would just speak to uh, for all of us um, are the benefit, the huge benefit, at least in my opinion, of the IFCs. Those items for consideration are really terrific in terms of providing information that we haven't had before and um, uh, really allows us to see how staff is thinking. And then the cool thing is, write it down at the bottom, because typically everything we do is gonna have some sort of motion to, to advance it, is you just see it right there, what the staff is requesting. And so your motion can simply follow what the, the staff recommendation is at the bottom. And uh, so I, I, those are just some hints from, from the field. Thank you, Alderperson Bourne. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, when I started uh, 12 years ago, we were required to be here one half hour before the meeting started, and that was for the purpose of signing documents and that type of thing, and that's been kind of relaxed. Uh, I would suggest, uh, based on my experience, to try to get here at least 15 minutes before the meeting because sometimes we have issues with our Chromebooks or our personal computers getting online, and sometimes there are stuff, there is stuff to read at the last minute. So it is a good idea. And especially I think it makes life easier for the, for the city clerk because of all those documents that have to be signed. And it's a good idea to get as many committee members on those documents as possible. I guess there's only a minimum of two, but it's nice if more people can sign them. Thank you for those comments. Um, the other item that's that's next would be uh, basic open records and open meetings primer. I think did we cover everything, Chuck? Or are there no, other we didn't. Um, but <coughs> I'm also not going to cover a whole presentation. And it's my hopes that maybe in the near future we'll have another presentation just on open meetings and and or um, uh, public records. But there are a couple things that I just want to make sure that that you remember. Uh, so that you don't get into any trouble. Open meetings laws, first of all, um, you know, they, they're designed to allow public access to information. They're designed to really limit the use of closed sessions so that there is more access to information. And these open meetings laws apply not only to what you would expect, the Common Council and their committees, commissions, and boards, but it really applies to all sorts of special study and advisory committees. Uh, other uh, bodies or subunits that are created by a governmental body, uh, even a number of quasi-governmental uh, corporations. So um, there are, no, if, if you are, uh, let's say you're appointed to a committee simply because you are an older person, uh, that arguably means that that body now has to comply with open meetings laws. And it's arguably, there are, there are arguments to be made, but to be safe, I would assume that that applies and you should insist on that when, when you're, whenever you're at any of those meetings. You don't want to get sued uh, as, for example, the um, Economic uh, Development Corporation in the city of Beaverdam did um, and people ended up having to pay out of their own pockets. Uh, there's a test to determine uh, when a meeting uh, is a meeting, and we talked about the, the quorum issues and the Wacom quorum issues. Uh, phone conferences, email chains can all uh, play into that. That's the, the, the numbers test. If half or more of the members are present or are involved in that, uh, there's a presumption that there is a meeting. 
<laughs> but you also have to look at the purpose. Uh, is it a meeting uh, for the purpose of being a meeting? Uh, first of all, if you have the numbers, again, it's presumed that it's a meeting, but that pr presumption can be rebutted. So it doesn't include social events. So uh, those of you who went to all the, all the person's wolf's party, you know, that wasn't an open meeting. That, that was a social event. Uh, sure, hopefully, sure. hopefully you weren't doing any business there. Um, uh, chance gatherings um, where you just happen to be, you know, you, you all, you know, I don't know, six of you end up going to the same church or something, you know, not a problem. Uh, that, that's, that's a chance uh, gathering. Um, chance gatherings at a conference, you, you know, you all decide somehow that, that you know, somebody's putting on a, uh, an event, um, you know, a, a, about a particular item and you all happen to show up at the same time because you thought as an alderman it might be useful for you to know about this. It's chance, um, not a problem. Now, if you think there's a good chance that all of, that, you know, a majority of you are going to be in some place at some time, please let us know um, because, uh, we certainly would rather be safe than sorry, and there are things that we can do to cover that. So, for example, when the Kohler Company had information sessions about uh, the golf course, we wanted to make sure that just to, re to rather be safe than sorry, we wanted to, to notice those. No action was being taken, but we noticed them as potential public meetings uh, just so that we can comply with the law. Closed sessions. Um, there are a very limited number of reasons why we can go into closed sessions. And uh, I would encourage you, um, you know, always look at on the agenda what is the reason that we're going into closed session. Read it for yourself ahead of time. Uh, it is required uh, under the law that we state the reason out loud at every meeting while we're going into closed session. My recommendation would be you just simply read what's on the agenda, just read it out that way. Um, you know that that you're covered. 19-19.85 um, is the state statute that that covers those uh, particular items that we can go into closed session. If it's not one of those items, we can't go into closed session. If we haven't noticed a closed session, we can't go into closed session. Uh, if we start talking about things that are not covered by the notice of closed session, you can't remain in closed session. Um, and you can only reconvene an open session if it's included in the public notice. Um, we, we generally have to vote in open session, uh, so we will go in back into open session in most cases. Uh, but there are some exceptions if the vote being in open session would compromise the need for the closed session, then there can be a vote in closed session. So for example, let's say um, you know, suddenly we, we're, we're getting sued um, by somebody and you need to talk to me about how should we act on, on this lawsuit. And you decide, and in closed session we need to have a vote to, you know, authorize uh, me to respond in a certain way in this lawsuit, like offer X amount of money. Well, that's going to happen in closed session because to go into open session and say, why don't we offer this person $10,000 but start at five to see, you know, and then go up to 10. Well, obviously that's, that's silly and, and, and we, we don't want to do that. We can be in closed session for those kinds of things. But if, the, if it is outside of the reason in closed session, it has to be done in open session. There's potential of fines and you can, you can pay those fines out of your own pocket. Uh, there is actually personal liability uh, for these kinds of violations. So, um, if you ever have any kind of concern about uh, open meetings laws, please contact us. Please let us know, uh, and we will do everything we can uh, to help you. Uh, also, there are other penalties on, on the city as well. Courts can void decisions that are made. We've heard about that happening to the school district. Uh, and you, we, we as a city, if we violate open meetings laws, could end up having to pay uh, attorney's fees. I'm not going to go through sort of scenarios because we're running short on time, but uh, if, frankly, if you ever have any questions, even if there's just sort of what if, give our office a call. We're, we'll be happy to talk to you about that. The flip side of over open government besides uh, public meetings or open meetings is uh, open records. Uh, and this is important to you as well because generally anybody can request to inspect any record that's kept or created or maintained by a governmental entity. And that can include 
documents that you yourself have created and you yourself are the records custodian for. So, for example, you send an email to a fellow alderman about an item on the agenda. That is a public record. You are the records custodian for that. So if someone comes to you and says, well, the person, Wolf, I want copies of X, Y, and Z, and if, you're, if you have that, re if, if you were the custodian of that record, really regardless of whether you still have it or not, you're responsible for providing that. Now, we will help you. Um, we very much encourage you, um, strongly encourage you, maybe urge you to do all of your city business via email on city email. Don't use your personal emails uh, because uh, city email, it's a lot easier for us to grab that stuff, make responses without, you know, I don't want to have to go through your personal email to determine whether items are actually going to have to be uh, released uh, to uh, a requester. Um, I really don't want to do that. I don't want to read all your email. Um, so who is a records custodian? Well, you are a custodian for any of the documents that you create or you uh, maintain, and that includes your, your email. Uh, who's a records requester? Just about anybody who asks for a document is a records requester, whether it's the press, uh, whether it's uh, folks that, you know, call themselves the press and some people don't think that they are, uh, whether it's an individual person um, who just wants a piece of information. They all are entitled uh, to those documents and, and we need to provide them. What is a record? Just about everything is a record. Now there are some exceptions. Um, uh, some, of, some of the exceptions to that would be drafts and notes and preliminary documents, things that are available for sale or already available at the library things that are purely personal. So like if I use my city email, which I'm allowed to do because we're allowed to have you know, small amounts of, of personal use of our city email. If I send an email to my wife saying, hey, food trucks tonight, you know, get me a taco from, from Jose's taco truck, that doesn't have to be released. But if there is a request for all the emails from all the person Wolf, uh, on his email account, and he asks his wife to go get him a taco at, at, so that when he comes home from a council meeting, he has something to eat. At least I'm going to have to review that. Um, I won't release it, uh, but I'm going to have to review that. So again, be careful as to how you use your, your city email. Uh, if you ever have a question about how to handle things, uh, we're here to help you with that. We want to make sure you don't get in trouble uh, with regard uh, to records. Uh, there are, there's one other issue I just want to mention, and that's text messages. Uh, text messages at this point, the law is changing. Um, and frankly, we are doing some things uh, internally to preserve text messages. Um, I would, what I would encourage you to do is not assume that forever and ever text messages are going to get handled just the way phone calls are, as if they sort of disappear into the ether. We recognize that there are issues, and I think that we do have some protection because you can't just store text messages forever and ever, and you don't necessarily control that. Um, so there is some protection there, um, but I think the way the law is moving is that eventually, at least for as long as you are able to store those text messages, if you're using texting to do city business, it's going to have to be uh, preserved. Um, I think that's where the law is headed. Uh, we're not quite there yet. Use email rather than text would be my recommendation. Yes? So my concern is um, preserving emails. And it's my understanding just to confirm that even if I delete an email from my <coughs> system, the city maintains all of those emails. Yes, we do. Good. We maintain all those emails. Um, uh, there are some issues, I know we, we've had some discussion about what happens when you block emails. Uh, we can't just unilaterally block all me emails from a single user because the problem is, is that that causes some problems for us as far as maintaining those documents for the purpose of public records. So um, unfortunately, even though we understand that some of you are having an issue with one or more people, um, we can't block those things if there's any chance uh, that they potentially would be a public record. Now, we do have spam filters and some things like that that um, will prevent things that are clearly not uh, public records. Uh, 
Other questions uh, about either of these open government issues? Yes. What if some of the emails we get on our city website are obviously they want us to come to a seminar or, or they're selling something like that? Uh, you know, those get through and they're not considered to be spam. Who's, who's making the, uh, the uh, judgment on whether those go through as a regular email or, or they come through as, uh, you know, spam or something like that? Well, if, so so um, IT has set up spam filters. I, you know, Greg can probably help you a little more on exactly how those spam filters work. But the spam filters are designed to really only catch spam. Um, and, and, and it's really not, anything that might be a public record is not supposed to come through. What that means is there are many things that come through on our email accounts that are just not caught by the spam filter that are spam. <clears throat> and that means is that when I'm working on open records requests, I'm often you know, saying, well, I have, I have to go through and look, this is non-responsive, this is non-responsive. I, I see a lot of stuff that's non-responsive. So, for example, when, when I did an open records request, uh, when there was a request by the Friends of Black River um, for anything related to, you know, the, the golf course, well, we used the word Kohler as, um, you know, as, as a search term. Well, there was a lot of stuff that came up under Kohler that had nothing to do with that, and so that was non-responsive. We didn't have to provide that, and we worked, we worked that out with them. And generally, most um, records requesters are very reasonable. If if they make a request that is just going to be impossible for us to work with, we talk to them and we say, "Hey, look, we'll do what you want, but um, it's probably going to get you way more than you want. It's going to cost you a lot of money." Let's, let's work out a way of, of doing this that's more reasonable. And, you know, frankly, I've never, while we've occasionally had to work out deals on what exactly we use for search terms, I've never had anybody who says, no, no, exactly what I said, that's, a, that's the only way I want it. I don't care whether it ends up, you know, costing me $40,000 because we're providing you, uh, you know, 2 million documents. Any other questions there? Okay, and then the last item was uh, becoming an older person. Older person Donahue, you had a few items there? Sure. <clears throat> and I'll keep it really short because it's quarter to eight. Um, and, but this goes, to, I think, to the fact that um, the city is some tricky stuff. There are lots and lots of moving parts, and I think Daryl's presentation about um, just the budget alone shows you how complex everything is. So there were just a couple of things that I wanted to cover. Um, with respect to emails, my, my general deal is that if somebody sends me city business on my personal email, like a friend or whatever, I just automatically forward it to my city email because I can guarantee you I don't want Chuck going through my personal emails. And I want to be able to say, swear, you know, three hands, three fingers high that there's no city business on my on my personal email. So if you can try to do that, I think that really is, uh, is very helpful. Um, so the, the <laughs> Ron and I were on the school board together, and I was on for six years, Ron, longer, much longer than that. Um, I got more phone call, constituent phone calls in the first three months of being an alder than I did six years on the school board. And it's just, it, it's just part of the job. And the way, and I actually enjoy it usually um, because it is real problem solving and we have a lot of tools to solve the problems that our constituents present to us. Just a couple of things, particularly if you have a temper, which I have just a little, a little bit of temper, just a little. Um, people, it's like at the public forum, you know, when people stand here and yell at us, you know, kind of gets you a little riled up and you can't, it's just smooth. When people call you, they're usually up, really upset about something. So what they really want to do is yell at you or just because you represent, why are the seagulls eating my garbage? Why is that pothole? Why did the city plowing come through six times on my cul-de-sac? Did you know that happened? No. Uh, but, you know, people <laughs> do get very upset. And one of the, from, and I'm just talking about my own personal experience, one of the important things is just to stay cool, and some of us do that much easier than others. 
I've never seen Ron get upset. So, you know, it's like, whereas he sees it every day, you know, so it, it, it's, the important thing is, is to take a deep breath and listen. And that's the other thing that's sometimes really hard for me. What, what really is the problem? What are people, what, what is the constituent's concern? And listening hard is really the, the way, the way to, to start figuring out how to solve the problem. And then basically, nine times out of 10, it is just knowing who to connect to in the city, the staff person that can solve the problem for you because 99% of the time, our staff is sophisticated and there are people there who can help. And how do you find that out? Uh, sometimes it's real evident. Uh, sometimes you just learn. I know that if somebody calls about a stop sign or a traffic study or whatever, I call Ryan. Uh, or I send him an email and then things get taken care of. If it's about you know weeds in the grass, I know I contact Bob Wallace or the other guy. And, and those are just things that one, if you don't know who to contact, call a fellow Walter or talk to the mayor or Daryl or Chuck and, and we, can, we can get connected to the people who can actually solve the problem. And that really works pretty well. Sometimes problems have been uh, complicated enough that you know I've been in a meeting with two or three people to try to figure out a drug house or a parking lot behind a tavern or, or whatever. And that's a good way of doing business too. Um, and you can gather, uh, we had a, a drug house issue, and I said to the neighbor who was calling me, I said, you get four or five people to come into the room. I'll get somebody from the police department. I'll get the mayor there. It was an, We had it at the senior center. It was a great meeting. There were like eight or nine of us, and we made a plan, and, and it was taken care of. So I, I just want to tell you, so much of what we do is problem solving, and, you know, enjoy it, because it really is part of the job. The other important thing <clears throat> we can't have spouses do this for us or friends because, I, and correct me if I'm wrong, when we act in a legislative capacity, we have immunity from prosecution? Generally. <laughs> That's a lawyer. <laughs> That's a lawyer. <laughs> generally, except for certain circumstances. Yeah. But generally, you know, we can't get sued if we're doing the city's business. But if my husband is trying to solve a problem for a constituent, then I think it's a, different, it's a different concern. So really, it has to be between you and city staff as to how to, to resolve questions and concerns. Um, moving right along. The maps. Oh, I love the maps. In the old days, McLean, the Sheboygan Press did a full page ad of the city, not an ad, but a, a printout of, this, of city districts. And mine are actually curling and, you know, I've scotch taped them to the, to the walls and so forth. This is good. It's a little hard to read. Um, it'd be great if the Sheboygan Press would perform that. And they were in full color, too. I mean, it was really nice. Um, this is helpful. Um, Meredith tells us that we're going to get really detailed maps. You can go on the county board site and you can find your district. But it's really helpful to know what... If you have a constituent calling from Hoboken, you can say, hey, you, you can say, you're not in my district. I don't do that. I say, hey, you're not in my district, but let's see what we can do, all right? So we'll be getting uh, maps and bigger and bigger maps would be great, but um, put them up on the wall because you'll, you'll need them. One of the great things about having only one alder per district is you're going to know that you are the one responsible for solving the problem, not the other person. So Andy Ross and I would independently work on solutions to problems. My other two partners in the past never worked on a solution, so you know it was that was a little bit easier. But at least you won't be doubling the the, the effort that 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 you're doing in terms of problem solving, and you also won't be canceling out votes. Oh, what did I do with my little whoopee? On your chair. On my chair, thank you. Um, I'm getting there. Um, emails, sometimes you, you, know, you just kind of, it's so important with everybody to be polite and to not call names and to, particularly with emails because people can see them. Um, 
when I started on the council, and the new folks have maybe already done this, tours. Our department heads love to give tours, and they're wonderful. I grew up near the water treatment facility, and I, we always thought it was like some dungeon. And so to be able to go through the water, uh, the, the treatment plant, or the, 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 the water thing on, on Valrath, utility. Valrath Park. Thank you, the water utility. It's pretty fascinating. And um, the police department, the fire department, public works, boy, I learned a lot. You guys make 14,000 signs a year, I think, something in that area. So um, they're really happy um, to see you, to talk to you, to explain what's going on. Um, Wendy, the senior center is great if you haven't been there. The personnel of the human resources department is, you know, like three rooms, so that's not, <laughs> you know, quite as exciting. But I would strongly urge you to do that. <laughs> right. It'll be less now. Yeah, development isn't that exciting either. Finance, oh man. <laughs> But the department heads that have cool departments really, you know, take the tours. It's really, it's really fun. Um, and how to get things done. So how to get from, you've got a constituent who says, you know, this is really an issue for me and you think it's a, what you can do is ask the city attorney's office to draft resolutions um, we've had quite a few in the time, and Jim's been on much longer than I, um, of alders that have brought resolutions forward to attempt to solve uh, problems. Here's the deal. Without violating a walking quorum, see if you can get the support of one or two other alders. <coughs> and then go into Chuck's office and say, hey, this is what we'd really like to try. Um, so getting... If, if you think that something can't be resolved you know, just through regular advocacy, but it's really a systemic problem, drafting a, a resolution or whatever, the city attorney's office will do that, but it's best if we can do that with two or three other people. That would not be a violation of, of, uh, of uh, open meetings. And so it's just, I was here for a full year before I even began to understand what was going on. So, um, and I'm a slow study. So, others of you will, you know, f figure out this much more quickly than I did. But ask, we're, we're thinking about putting together a board buddy, you know, a, a council buddy, just somebody that you can speak with specifically, not sure that's gonna happen. But in any event, because um, it is so much and it takes a long time, okay? Thank you. Another suggestion would be is to take that item and ask the chairman of the appropriate committee to put it on his agenda and, and then you can have that discussion in the meeting with the other alders and you can then ask Chuck to draw documents uh, for the proposed resolution. Well, that concludes the, uh, the schedule for today. Thank you very much for everybody that was presenting. And uh, now we'll get back to the council agenda. Uh, next item is hearings. We have two hearings this evening. Uh, the first one is hearing number one of 1819 to amend the city of Sheboygan's future land use map of the city's comprehensive plan in order to change the land use classification of the property located at 3226. Dash 3302 Superior Avenue for multifamily residential to community mixed use. Is there anyone who wishes to be heard? Is there anyone who wishes to be heard? Is there anyone who wishes to be heard? Alderperson Wolf. Thank you, Mayor. I make a motion to close. Second. Thank you for that motion and support. All those in favor of closing the hearings, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. The second hearing is uh, hearing number two of 1819 to amend the city of Sheboygan's official zoning map to change the use district classification of the property located at 3226-3302 Superior Avenue from class urban residential UR12 to class suburban office SO. Is there anyone wishing to be heard? Is there anyone wishing to be heard? Is there anyone wishing to be heard? Alderperson Wolf. Thank you, Mayor. I make a motion to close. Second. Thank you for that motion and support. 
All those in favor of closing the hearing, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Next, we move on to consent agenda. That would include items 3.2 through 3.15. Alderperson Wolf. Thank you, Mayor. I make a motion uh, to accept and file all our, all our O's, accept and adopt all our C's, and pass all resolutions and ordinances. Thank you for that motion and support. Is there any uh, one that has any discussion on any of the items on the consent agenda? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll for passage? Motion passes. Next, we will move on to reports of officers. Items 4.1 through 4.18 will be referred to various committees. Under resolutions, um, items 5.1 through 5.5 will again be referred to various committees. Under reports of committees, 6.1 is RC number 8 of 1819 by Public Works Committee to whom was referred direct referral resolution number 5 of 1819 by Alderperson Wolf authorizing the appropriate city officials to enter into a contract with Butine Peterson Construction Company for $2,420,317.28 in Miller Engineers and Scientists for the amount of $4,000 for the capital improvement resurfacing project and recommends passing the resolution. Alderperson Wolf. Thank you, Mayor. I make a, a motion to accept and adopt and pass the resolution. Second. Thank you for that motion and support. Is there any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll? Nine eyes. Motion passes. Item 6.2 is RC number 9 of 1819 by the Public Works Committee to whom is referred direct referral resolution number 7 of 1819 by Alderperson Wolf authorizing the appropriate city officials to enter into a contract with Vinton Construction Company for $242,397.57 and Miller Consulting Engineers and Scientists for the amount of $4,000 for the Concord Drive Storm Sewer and Wilson Avenue Storm Sewer Outfall Project and recommends passing the resolution. Alderperson Wolf. Thank you, Mayor. I make a motion to accept and adopt and pass resolution. Second. Thank you for that motion and support. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll? <clears throat> Nine eyes. Motion passes. Item 6.3 is RC number 10 of 1819 by the Public Works Committee to whom is referred direct referral resolution number 11 of 1819 by Alderpersons Wolf Sorensen authorizing entering into an amended memorandum of understanding with Sheboygan Park Project regarding the Shaw Family Playground at Evergreen Park designed for use by children of all abilities and recommends passing the resolution. Alderperson Wolf. Thank you, Mayor. I make a motion to accept and adopt and pass the resolution. Second. Thank you for that motion and support. Any discussion on the uh, motion? Seeing none, will the clerk call the roll? Nine eyes. Motion passes. Item 6.4 is RC number 11 of 1819 by the Public Works Committee to whom was referred direct referral resolution number 6 of 1819 by Alderperson Wolf accepting the gift 
of $489,567 worth of playground equipment from the Sheboygan Park Project for the Shaw Family Playground to be installed in area number area two of Evergreen Park and recommends passing the resolution. Alderperson Wolf. Thank you, Mayor. I make a motion to accept and adopt and pass the resolution. Second. Thank you for that motion and support. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll? Nine eyes. Motion passes. Under general ordinances, uh, that will be um, referred to the Public Works Committee. Next, move on to other matters received after the agenda was published. Turn it over to the City Attorney. 8.1 is an RO by the City Clerk submitting various license applications for the period ending June 30th, 2018, December 31st, 2018, April 14, 2019, June 30th, 2019, and June 30th, 2020. That'll be referred to the Licensing Hearings and Public Safety Committee. 8.2 is a resolution by Alderpersons Wolf and Sorensen approving the items, the terms and conditions of the land lease agreement for Butson Sports Complex between the City of Sheboygan and Lakeshore United FC for a soccer facility to be located on the west side of South Business Drive between Hiawatha Court and Barron's Parkway. That'll be referred to the Public Works Committee. 8.3 is a resolution by Alderpersons Rindfleisch and Boren authorizing the purchase of approximately uh, 83 one hundredths of an acre of land and building located on the northern portion of 1211 North 23rd Street for future use by the city. That will also be referred to the Public Works Committee. <clears throat> Next is a motion to go, go into a contemplated, I'm sorry, Alderperson Boren. Thanks, Mayor. On that last one that was uh, brought in by Alderman Rinfleisch and myself, was that originally at Finance and Personnel, but we're switching it over to Public Works? Wasn't that that, was that that, that, that land that was right next to the police department where we're getting an easement and then we we sent it back and now it's coming back or am I thinking of a different document this is the I believe this is for the purchase of the uh, salt shed yes should it go to finance probably it could go either way it's Public Works is the reason. That Public Works would be using the salt shed, so that's why we determined it would go there eventually. It would be uh, possibly used by the police department in the future. Okay. Yeah, I, I just thought it was a previous document that went that went back and it was coming back, but it's a different one. It is a different document. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, and um, Alderperson Wolf. Thank you, Mayor. I'm going to make a motion uh, to convene in closed session under the exemption provided in Section 19.85 sub 1 sub e, Wisconsin Stats, where competitive bargaining and bargaining reasons require a closed session regarding a development opportunity in the South Point Enterprise Campus and for the purpose of deliberating uh, possible tentative agreement uh, for the Sheboygan Professional Police Officers Association. Is there a second? I'm sorry, second. Okay, clerk, please call the roll. Hi. Nine eyes. Uh, motion passes. We'll take a short recess, about uh, three minutes, and uh, for the people watching at home, this will conclude our broadcast for this evening. We plan to adjourn in closed session.